All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, as I said, my name is uh, Paige Mulhern. I'm the creative director of Best Bees Company. You might be getting some emails from me. Uh, and it's great to see everyone's faces. I can't wait to have a great discussion with Renee um, and Aaliyah here. Renee is going to teach us some amazing things from the garden of how to uh, best nurture your bees um, during the summer months. Um, we wanted to give you all a special event as our flagship customers in Boston, where uh, Lee and I are today. Um, given the slight delay of your bees this year, we thought it would be important to give you guys extra information um, and advice on how to best take care of them um, with, uh, of course, our help. And I'll give uh, Aaliyah the mic for a minute to just introduce herself and then we'll go forth with what you all came for, which is the garden. So yeah. hi everybody. Yeah, so great to see you all. We would love to have this in person and we eventually will have a Boston client in-person event where we can do some hands-on learning, I imagine. Um, but yeah, exactly as Paige said, we really wanted to gear an event towards our Boston clients. Um, specifically utilizing Renee's expertise to how you can influence your bees by what you plant. Um, we're excited for this. It's great to see everybody's faces. We have a fire alarm that's on low battery, so you might hear some strange beeping in the back. We'll be muted for most of the time, but if you hear it right now, that's what's going on. <laughs> Sorry about it. Um, and then, yeah, just just some Zoom etiquette, just so everyone feels comfy and knows uh, what we're what we're expecting today. So we're gonna have you on mute um, while Renee is speaking uh, for the first half hour, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, but please, in the meantime, you know, put your questions in the chat. We'll We'll be addressing them. Um, feel free to share with, put your video on so we can see your faces. Feel free to, you know, privately message someone, say hi. Um, you know, this is a community that we're really excited to be a part of, and we're really happy to have you all be a part of. So um, we're looking forward to some, some good discussion. Um, all right. So with no, for no more further ado, I would love to put Renee on pin and uh, give you the floor, Renee. Great, hello, and I would love to see faces because I'm one of those like to engage with people so we can grow together. My name is Renee and I am the lead horticulturist for the Best Bees Company. I'm also the owner of Gardens by Renee. We are on a mission to connect people to their food, nature, and one another. We do that through design, build, maintenance, I call it care, of edible and sustainable landscapes. For me, 10 years ago, didn't notice it so much. Five years ago, started noticing that I wasn't seeing as many pollinators out there. As a food grower, as someone who's out there producing food in people's backyards, it really started to, to resonate with me. Um, so I started stalking Noah and the Best Bees Company on social media platforms, fell in love with them, and fell in love with their mission to improve bee and pollinator health globally. So I give my time to Gardens by Renee, but I also give my time to the Best Bees Company because I believe wholeheartedly in their mission. So before I get going and starting discussing plants, which is what my passion is, I want to make sure that I say thank you for your support. Um, we are all in this together and we actually are making a difference. You have to believe that and you have to know that. Um, Noah and I like to play around sometimes and say we're trying to save the world one bee and one seed at a time. So again, thank you for your support to the Best Bees Company, to our pollinators and to our environment at large. So let's get started. Um, I do like engagement. I do like questions. I feel most comfortable when I'm in the garden, when I'm talking to people, when my hands are flapping. Um, the formal format is not my most comfort zone, so bring it on. Um, I am gonna start with talking about our plants. Um, spring is a perfect time to be planting our gardens, especially when we're thinking ahead about summer and fall. You don't necessarily want to be planting summer gardens in the summer. You want to plant it now when it's cooler, when the moisture is there, and where we're not in a drought or when we're on rain, um, water bands where it's hard to water. A lot of the times when you sink new plants into the ground, they need about two weeks of constant water, constant care. So now is an easier time to manage that. 
um, what I'm going to do is just start with my top 10 favorite plants. And we will be sharing with you lists later that include some of my top 10, but also include plants that are um, low maintenance and more importantly, plants that are on our honey DNA list. I don't know how many of you out there, maybe you can chime in in the chat, have had honey DNA tests. It would be awesome if those of you who have had the test would share with us. My garden, thankfully, um, showed that my bees were eating on cucumber and melon. So as an edible landscape professional, I'm like, yes, it's working. They're actually eating what I'm feeding them. So that's pretty exciting. Um, so what I like to plant, I think the biggest is anise hyssop. I don't have an anise hyssop large plant right now. They're just coming up. I have some that are just kind of scattered in my yard. Um, the reason why I like anise hyssop, it's a huge pollinator feeder and honeybee feeder, but it also is a little thuggish. And what I mean by that is it kind of self sows itself. It just spreads everywhere in my yard. And I'm fine with that because what I can do is I can be selective as in, I don't mind it over here or geez, you know what? It's getting a little out of control. I actually have a little bit of it growing right now. So this is a Baptisia plant that I bought last fall for the garden and it's a false indigo and I didn't get a chance to plant it. I kind of quit at the end of the season. It's usually what happens to me. I'm done and I just can't do anymore. So I think if I come in close here, you can see that these are all little teeny tiny baby anise hyssops. Not only do I love it because it's a huge bee and pollinator plant, but it tastes like licorice. And I like to do a lot of garden to glass events where I create simple syrups using my honey from my bees and herbs that I'm growing in my yard to make delicious cocktails, mocktails, and tea. So anise hyssop is something that works really well with our honey to make a simple syrup, to make a cocktail with bourbon, or to make an iced tea, or um, you can also use it on roasting vegetables. So anise hyssop, a delicious plant that self sows plant that feeds bees, worth taking up space and time in your garden. Another plant, um, aster, is another top 10 for me. That's more of a fall plant, but again, when you're thinking about designing a pollinator habitat, which is what we wanna do, right? We wanna take up space in our landscape that is feeding the bees. If you wanna save the bees, you need to feed the bees. The Best Bees Company is doing huge research. We know pesticides is a problem. We know climate change is, is hurting us. But what we also are learning through all the research that we're doing through the beehives, the over a thousand beehives we have nationwide, thanks to um, people like you, is that it's also habitat loss. So habitat loss is real. So plant, 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 which is, you know, music to my ears. Um, so aster is another one that'll bloom late fall, late summer into fall. Um, I love bee balm, Monardo. A lot of people know bee balm. Bee balm is a great plant. It will come up. Um, sometimes it has a problem with mildew, but you can buy cultivars that don't aren't affected by the mildew as much, the powdery mildews, but bee balm is another plant. And again, the flowers are edible. So for me, when I'm looking at planting plants in either clients' gardens or in my own home garden, I really wanna be able to eat. I wanna snack. If I wanna throw some edible flowers into my salad, I just wanna be able to pick and go. So when I go to my garden and harvest at night, I'm picking salad, I'm picking herbs, and I'm picking edible flowers. So you can eat bee balm. Let's see, I have my list because I don't want to get lost. Blanket flower, Gerardia is another fantastic plant for our bees. Um, that's more of an annual. It doesn't come back every year like our perennial bee balm. Or um, this is yarrow. It's also called Achillea. It's not blooming right now. You can see some clusters here. Um, this is a white one. So what I love about the um, yarrow is that you can get it in yellow, you can get it in white, you can get it in multi kind of raspberry pink hot colors. Our bees see in cool colors, and I'll let the professional beekeepers tell you, but I plant a lot of blues and a lot of whites for my bees because I want them to see it. I want them to know that I'm feeding them. So Anise Hysop is purple, lavender, um, the um, yarrow I did in white. Let's see, goldenrod, that's one that people go, oh, goldenrod, I'm allergic, hit you. No, um, Solidago, you're not allergic to. It's not what you're sneezing from. 
And the goldenrod is really important for our bees because it's kind of like that last push before they, um, they head out for the winter. So they need that extra food. So goldenrod is a great one. It's got these long, beautiful plumes of yellow and it does spread out. So it's great in masses. Um, that's something that I want to say. The Xerces Society, which we'll put this in at the end so you guys know about it. This is like a Bible to me. It actually sits at my nightstand along with a couple of other books and I'm always reading it. The Xerces Society is one of my favorite books. It's all about pollinator habitat. Their recommendation is that we plant in masses 12 to 20 plants. Not everybody has room for 12 to 20 plants at a whack. Um, I try to tell my clients, two for me, two for the bees. Two for me, four for the bees. Um, so you do want to try to plant six plants at a minimum. So if you have a small amount of space, it's better to plant multiples of one than it is to plant six individual. You really want to go for planting in the masses if you can. Um, Milkweed is another one that I love, Asclepius tuberosa. It's an orange beauty that I love. And the Best Bees Company is not just promoting honeybee health. It's as far from what we do as you can get. We're looking to promote honeybee and pollinator health for all bees, natives, and other pollinators. So it's really important for us to bring in a lot of diversity in the landscape so that we can feed all the bees. Our honeybees are indicator species. They're easy to manage, as you know, no problems with them on your land whatsoever. But we're not just looking out for the honeybee, we're looking out for all of it. We're, we're trying to get involved in what's happening in our environment and how can we make changes to better it and improve it and improve ourselves. Um, coneflower, I think a lot of people know about echinacea. I absolutely love echinacea because it feeds my bees. It's beautiful cut flower to bring in. It, it, it comes up on its own. It's a perennial. It makes lots of babies all over your yard. And then in the fall, I leave the seeds. Um, a lot of the times what I tell my clients is don't let your landscape company come in and clean your yard for the winter. Winter habitat is crucial for caterpillars and butterflies, and it hosts, it, it's a home to these, these insects. So don't let the landscapers just come and cut down everything. Those tall thistle-like cone flowers dry out and the birds will eat them through like December, January or until the snow comes. So as much as we want to be neat and clean and tidy because we've been conditioned to think that that's really the only way a landscape should look, we need more wild. It's like a junk drawer. You have to have space in your yard that's just free and wild. Wildflowers are crucial to our bees, our pollinators, our beneficial insects, and um, we really need to just lighten up a little bit. Like just be okay with a little bit of a mess every once in a while. Um, I think we're going to be okay. So purple coneflower, beautiful plant. Leave it up. Let the birds eat it. Let the bees eat it. Enjoy it. Um, Salvia, I think a lot of people know about salvia, another fantastic purple, beautiful kind of work horse of the landscape. It, it's easy and you'll see it almost in every landscape design. It's, it's a great plant. Um, I wanna talk about sunflowers. I love sunflowers because again, my primary focus is edible landscape. So to me, nothing looks better than lining my, a, a, you know, a, a garden enclosure area with pockets of sunflowers that are smiling at the world to see. Um, you, the um, sunflowers feed bees, they feed birds, they feed everything. But what you want to look out for is society has hybridized a lot of our plants. So when you're purchasing sunflower seeds, you want to make sure that it's not a hybridized seed. They hybridized it to not be messy because somewhere along the line, taking that sunflower from the farmer's market home left a little pollen on the dashboard and people got upset about that. So we don't want sunflowers that are pollen less. We don't want sunflowers that don't have pollen. We need the pollen for the bees. So plant the sunflowers. Just be sure that you're purchasing sunflowers. Um, and it's skipping my brain right now. I think it's like lemon queen or there's a few varieties. And again, back to my Bible, they tell you what kind of sunflowers. Don't get the hybridized ones. While I'm on hybridized, I want to bring up roses. We find a lot of roses in our honey DNA samples that come back. Everybody loves roses. I love roses. But you want to make sure that you're planting roses that are not double bloomed. 
um, when you get those double blooms versus a flat petal, the bees kind of get stuck and they wiggle in and they can't get in. So you're really stressing them out because they're like, man, I know that there's something in there, but I can't get there. So go with flat petaled roses. Rosa Ragosa is a great example. It's not a native, but it's a beautiful flat petaled rose. So roses are great, just not big double blooms where the bees can't get in. Um, you gotta be careful of the hybridized plants. So when you're purchasing plants, you kind of want to make sure that it's just a open pollinator and it's it's not been modified for uh, for you know humans. We want to feed the bees. That's the main goal. Um, raspberries, blackberries. I don't know if you can see it. I have wild raspberries that just some bird probably ate it, pooped it out, and it landed in my herb garden container. I'm leaving it this year. I love it. Again, free plants you know, self-propagating, fantastic. Can't say enough about um, raspberries, blackberries. Again, they're feeding our bees early spring with their flowers. They're then feeding our birds. They're then feeding our wildlife. And if you get out there and you pick a handful or two, they're feeding you. So beneficial, beneficial, beneficial. I feel the same way about our blueberry shrubs, our blueberry bushes, native to New England, fantastic fall foliage, but again, flowers for spring for the bees, and then food later for the birds, the wildlife, and for us, if we're that lucky to actually get some. Um, the other thing, the last thing I think, and then I'm gonna show you some plants really quick, because that's the fun part, I think, and then I'll get you all jazzed up and you guys will all go shopping and be planting this weekend. Um, herbs, our bees love herbs, and so do I. I, the oregano is one of their favorites, basil, mint, cilantro, thyme, but again, one for me, three for the bees, two for me, four for the bees. And when I say that, what you want to do, and I do have a little bit of an example, it's really sad because it's been in my house and I've been trying to get it to grow for this event, so don't judge me. But with the herbs, you want them to set flower. So don't keep pinching and cutting out the flower. The flower stalk that comes up you keep one plant for yourself that you're not going to let go to flower, but then let three or four go to flower. I hope you can see this, but this is actually a cilantro plant that's flowering. Can you see that? Can you see the little white flowers? Some of the best beneficial insects, our allies in our garden, love these flowers. Then what's going to happen is this flower is going to set seeds and the cilantro seeds are just going to disperse all over my yard. Yay me, free cilantro next year. I don't purchase seeds for cilantro ever. I don't have to buy dill. I don't have to get anise high sop. It's all self-sowing all over my yard. I go in and I selectively pick out where I don't want it. But again, when you're planting our herbs for our bees and our bumbles and our pollinators, one for you, but then several for the bees. Time, let it go to flower, oregano, they love oregano. And I do believe that oregano is a high one in our um, honey DNA. Again, cilantro, great plant for the cool season. It's not a hot summer crop. So what I'm gonna do with this is let it go to seed and then I'll have cilantro babies all over my yard. Lavender is another fantastic plant for our bees. They love it. So this is a beauty. Let me see if there's anything else here. Mint, um, I know everybody knows this. Everybody knows it and they still just don't listen. So I'm gonna repeat it. Mint does not go in your garden. It goes in a cement container where it can't escape and even then it will. So be careful with mint, but enjoy mint. Mint is awesome. I have it in my water almost every day. You can take a tub in it. If you're hot in the summer, take a cool, refreshing minty tub. You can make cocktails out of it. And again, if you allow it to create flowers, the bees love it. I think I've covered, oh, one more thing, because I have it here. Again, this is a plant that I meant to plant last fall, but I didn't get around to it. And I'm so thankful that it actually overwintered. This is a trumpet vine. It's an American trumpet vine. Do not purchase Japanese trumpet vine. It's an invasive, but this is a vining plant. This is gonna go all over a beautiful arbor that I have. And this is another bee and pollinator feeder. So, I think that's all I have for plants and I thank you. So I'm gonna open it up for questions and um, the girls are gonna answer any bee questions. I'm not a beekeeper. They take care of my bees for me, okay? I feed them, so thank you. 
All right. So I am asking everyone to unmute themselves. We had a question come in on the chat while you were speaking, which we could start with. Sure. Yeah. Blueberries. I have a question. It looks like blueberries. Blueberries are like the best. I think blueberries belong in every single landscape, at least six to 10 of them. They're native to New England. They have an amazing fall foliage. They feed the bees. They feed the birds. They feed the wildlife. They're low maintenance. You have to prune them every couple of years. Like you're not really having, to me, high maintenance plants are just, it's just too much. I can do other things with my time and my money. So um, I like low maintenance, native, drought tolerant, um, plants that are really feeding the, the pollinators. We need to take back some of this land that we have and, and create a healthy environment for our pollinators and our birds and our bats and our wildlife. Awesome. Hi, what was your question? I just jumped right in. No, blueberries, that's amazing. Another question, Asteria asked, can these plants be kept in containers? My son's beehives are in the city of Boston on a rooftop, which yay, beehive on the roof, amazing. Um, so she would like to give some plants, but with no yard, will they be in containers? So Renee, I know you can see yeah. a container. They actually, lo herbs love containers. Herbs love to be crammed in tight. They also, um, most herbs, they're not native to New England or United States, they're Mediterranean. So they like to be in that heat. So a rooftop is a great application for herbs. They kind of like to dry out. Um, the other thing I would recommend when you're talking about container gardening, especially in a microclimate like a rooftop, is get the self-watering containers. It's worth the extra $20, $30 for the pot um, because then you don't have to worry. They dry out really quickly up there with the wind and, and the lack of humidity and, and the beating sun. So containers are fantastic. Um, the Best Bees Company, we do have pollinator habitat on rooftops all across the country, and they do really well. We have irrigation for them, so I think that that's key. And, and planting the right plants. Again, going with, oh, I didn't mention sedum. This is a stone crop. This is a fantastic drought tolerant. Like I have this in a garden area that's not developed at all. It was just dug out. It's dirt that's crap dirt. There's nothing added to it. I put the sedum in there and it's living. So the sedum is um, fall um, plant um, flowers, but a great plant for low, low maintenance. Almost all the plants that I picked here today are low maintenance. I'm a low maintenance girl. I don't know. I don't want to have to fuss. There's other things we can be doing. <laughs> I love that. I mean, yeah. thank you. So a good follow-up question to that is, do you keep all plants in a planter container or are there maybe any more that you would recommend for containers um, in addition to herbs? Um, definitely. I mean, the lavenders, flowers. You can keep almost everything. You can even do some of the smaller blueberry cultivars in containers and raspberries. Um, so almost everything that I have that I talked about, you can do. You can do almost anything in a container as long as the container is big enough. Um, there are really, really high-end landscape company and architects in New York City that are growing trees. It's just a matter of how big the container is and making sure that that root zone is getting wet. You want to make sure you're not just surface watering, the roots need to be absorbing. So size of the container is, the size of the container depends on size of the plants, but um, a, lot of, a lot of plants do very well. Almost all of my edible landscapes are in growing boxes and those are basically just a container. I have a lot easier time managing food growing in containers than I do in the ground, like a lot better. I saw something about grass and I just want to touch base on that. It went somewhere, but I didn't bring it up. But clover is like another one of those fantastic bee feeders and it produces a flower in the summer. And again, Aaliyah or Paige can talk about the dirt more than I can because I was actually under the impression that fall was when the bees need more food. But then I'm learning, because as always, we're learning so much from the Best Bees Company. It's mind blowing. Um, but we're learning that really summer, they need food in the summer. So clover is a fantastic plant. It's a ground cover. It's also a nitrogen fixing plant. So it grabs nitrogen from the atmosphere and it deposits, deposits it into the root zone. So you're creating healthy soil. So you're feeding the bees, you're creating healthy soil, you're doing a ground cover where you're not doing grass and you're not watering or you're not having to do mulch. So win-win. Um, the only thing I would have to say is as a girl who grew up in Provincetown barefoot, literally, um, you can't really walk on a clover lawn barefoot because the bees are just foraging everywhere. Um, that's the only thing. It doesn't deter me. 
Um, I am creating a clover lawn right now because my goal will be to plant a squash patch. And since I only had crap dirt and, and compacted earth and it was kind of like the builder came in and stripped the earth and put down like a quarter of an inch of something, I have no way to grow anything out there. So I've dumped compost, I've added the clover seeds for two years now and I now have clover. So after this summer, I'll be kind of turning it in and starting some squash patches because now my earth will have enough nitrogen and will be a little bit healthier to, to provide food for my family and neighbors. <laughs> Excellent. Um, are there any other ground covers besides clover that you would recommend instead I mean, of grass? Believe it or not, I love strawberries. It's one of those things where you're not necessarily using strawberry as a ground cover to eat the strawberries. But when you get a strawberry that has the runners, they take over like mad. So what I've done is I've replaced the areas in my yard where there was pachysandra and I've replaced it with strawberries. If I really want to get a couple strawberries, I go out and I pick them. For the most part, the animals are eating them, but I like strawberries. I do like vinca. They seem to like it too. Um, so there are a lot of ground covers that you can get. Woodruff, sweet woodruff is another one. So yeah. Great. Okay, so Marissa asks any tips for bee feeding gardening and very, very hot and dry climates like Vegas. Oof. I would go on, get on Xerce Society and they may have, um, because what the Xerce Society book does that I'm showing you for the 15th time, they should be paying me for this because this is what I do on every event I do. I love it that much. Um, it talks about the zones and it talks about the areas. So I don't know anything about that area, but I'm sure that there would be a local organization out there. Um, just like we have, um, what is it? Something in the woods, garden in the woods here. We have a wildflower society. So specifically get into that area and, and find out locally what they're doing. Cause it's important, right plant, right place is like the oldest line for people who are into horticulture. You really, that's a great question that you're asking that. I'm sorry that I don't have the specific answer, but I do know where you can get that information, which would be online. Awesome. So thank you. Yes, great, great stuff. Okay. It's, just, it's drought, it's totally drought there. It's, and then you've got cold nights. So you've got hot days, drought and cold nights. So I know there's plants out there that'll work. I'm just not really, I don't have it. I don't have it. That's all good. Um, could you recommend some shade plants? perhaps that are good for bees? Sure, um, I like a still day. I like um, bleeding hearts. I like hookera. Coral bells is probably my favorite. And that's, that's, um, that's a great, and that also comes in all kinds of different colors too. So that's pretty to add pop. Um, there's also, oh, I can't remember the name of it. I, we, can, we can get somebody a, a shade list on that too. Yeah, I love that. Great, amazing. I'm a, sun um, girl. I'm a food girl, so for me, I'm always looking for sun, 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 sun. Yes, totally. Cool. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, we have got a question Are wood bees pollinators? Yes. So that's for the bee girls. Want me to take that one, Renee? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think by woods bees, I think that they're also carpenter bees. Mm -hmm. um, which do source nectar and in the act of sourcing nectar from flowers, they do catch pollen um, and that does help with pollination. So yes, they, they are known to be pollinators as well. Honeybees, so I believe that they're solitary bees. Um, so that means that there, there isn't a colony that they come back to where there's tens of thousands of pollinators. So the honeybees themselves tend to do a lot more of the pollination because they have such massive social networks in their hives. Um, yeah, that was a great answer. Um, cool. So let's see if there's any more questions in the chat. I don't know, but I love that somebody said, Tiggy said, clover lawn with shoes works fine. I am a, <laughs> I'm a dream of, no, I'm not, I want to do clover lawn. I dream of every lawn being a clover lawn. Yeah, amazing. Um, all right, that was all of our questions. Oh, wait, one more, one more from Sean. Also, after we answer this next question, I do recommend if you're if you're feeling a little adventurous, not too shy, you can put yourself off mute and ask a question live. So feel free to do that. But here we have Sean in the chat. He says, I live in a city and have a minimal space 
and a laddered bed on my porch, maybe 10 to 12 plants. Um, let's see, did you knowing I might only get to pick one or two plants, any recommendations on what would be, love that, the most positive for city bees with, since there's less green. So in other words, do you have like a favorite or maybe like a number one plant or is it really all plants are, that are good for bees are created equal? I, I mean, I love anise hyssop because of the fact that I can make syrups out of it. I can use it for cooking, it's an herb. But I think in this situation, Sean, I'm dreaming of lavender. I think that that's what's striking me the most for if I'm thinking about myself living up on a rooftop and the sun is baking down and I'm hanging out and I want to just be surrounded. I think lavender, lavender is very therapeutic. Um, I work with it with um, assisted living and memory loss patients and just by stroking it into I'm hyper, like I have to snort lavender a lot just to come down. So I think that if I were living in the city, I would want to be surrounded by lavender. Oh, that's a beautiful answer. And herbs. Just all herbs and lavender. I love that. All right. Does anyone have any um, more questions, maybe about what to grow or about bees? Or about food growing, since I am here. We didn't talk about peas. Peas are another plant that the bees love. I didn't mention fruit trees. I am not a tree expert, but I can <laughs> tell you that the trees are heavy. I think it's their pollen. I, I wrote it down. It's an excellent source of protein-rich pollen. So fruit trees, stone fruits, apricots, cherries, those are really, really, peach, really good for bees. For those of you who have the space, fruit trees are huge. I don't know a lot about them, but I, I want, it's next on my list to master. All right. Um, I don't know if you see our screen, but we just had a pop in from Noah. What's up? <laughs> so good to see you guys. All, all fully vaccinated and able to be in a room together with our masks on. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. For, this is great. For, Thank you for doing this. This is so exciting. Yay. Um, Linda asks, when you say squash, Renee, what type of squash are you playing? Well, my honey DNA test results came back and showed that my babies are eating melon. So I grew cantaloupe and cucumbers last year. Um, but as far as squash goes for my clover lawn, soon to be squash lawn, I'm going to go with butternut because it's one of my all-time favorites, acorn, acorn, curry, and maybe spaghetti. So those I'll start planting sometime in August for the fall after I get my little more compost added to that lawn. Cool, thanks. I could add a fun little fact about squash bees. If you guys don't know about these native bees, they take a nap inside a squash flower at high noon when the sun is so strong. Sometimes these flowers close midday, the bees will take a nap and then they open in the afternoon and the bees continue flying. What a life. So now well, I don't think I could be a bee right now. And on that, that's a great, um, borage is another one that I didn't mention. And mm -hmm. squash, um, borage actually attracts an insect, insect that pollinates squash. So if you're having a hard time with your squash pollination, if you want to go in there and pollinate yourself, you're welcome to. But another theory out there is that you bring in borage to the garden, which brings in this specific insect, insect that helps pollinate squash. And borage is edible, both flower and leaf. It self sows it drops its seeds all over. It's blue, it's beautiful on a martini or a plain water, whatever you want. Again, garden the glass. Um, so borage with the squash. And, and that just reminded me of that, Noah, because now I feel like I've got to plant more borage everywhere. Another fantastic edible herb. Herbs are underrated. Herbs are like the best, easy, low maintenance, good for the bees, good for us. They look good, they smell good, they feel good. The other day I was at a client's house and I had gotten her lemon verbena and she didn't know what it was. And I was like, you don't know lemon verbena? And I ripped a leaf off and I rubbed it all over my arms. And then I was like, smell me. And then she was like, oh, it's so clean and soapy. And it's like, there's so many candles and so many soaps and creams and, and perfumes made from lemon verbena. So a lot of the times when I'm out gardening in my own yard, when I come home after work, I just grab herbs and rub them all over my body. And I really do help think that it helps with um, the mosquitoes. Amazing. It probably also helps with just a great mood elevator. Mm. Yeah, I really do think it works because it's like you, you kind of, like I said, with the lavender, like I can feel a level of calm when I'm done smelling my herbs. So I believe in them 100%. Yeah. 
fees. And um, that also made me think too, as, as um, loyal customers of Best Fees and having beehives, you know, we have some blog posts about how to make candles and um, using wax for other cosmetic uh, purposes. I can share that because that just with the lemon burbit, bur bur Verbena, <laughs> verbena. <laughs> um, you know, I'll get you a lemon verbena for the best bees rooftop garden because it's so pretty and it smells so good. Yeah. Yes. Make your, your own, wax candles. Having your own wax and your own herbs can make your own soap bars. Um, so Jacob here asks, "What are our thoughts on the flow hives versus regular beehives?" Um, I can I can start by answering that with my thoughts. Um, so yeah, we've all been beekeepers. Noah's been beekeeper for the longest. Elia had some beekeeping experience myself as well. Um, one, my main thought is that I think it's amazing that the beekeeping community is so innovative, and that you know this duo thought that you know how can we how can we draw more attention to the bees and make it more uh, I don't know just an exciting uh, invention. So I definitely give them props for it, taking honeybees and giving them such a global spotlight with that uh, GoFundMe back in 2015, 2014, whenever it was, it created so much buzz, if you will. Um, we have a flow hive at the Best Bees headquarters and we found that the bees just have not taken to it. So with that, maybe the old model is just kind of what they like better, um, you know, with natural uh, wood, no treatments, all organic wax, um, foundation, the bees just are really, you know, they really like what works. We haven't seen them really taking to the flow hives. So while I think it's great to cut for innovation and inspiration, um, we haven't seen that the bees like it that much. At least from our experience, I'm sure that there are, you know, maybe in Australia where it was, um, you know, born, the bees there might be more into it or maybe other people have had more success. But with at least New England, Boston bees, it's been a little bit tricky to to get them to be attracted to that, let alone to build enough resources to last a winter. So, and that is, they have uh, typically plastic cone shape in the crank yep. portion of the hive. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And we've we've also worked separate from flow hives, but we've tried out some plastic frames. Never, never wanting to use plastic, we always use our wax foundation and wood frame. Um, and yeah, when we've ever put a plastic frame in a hive, we always see less drawn out comb. The bees aren't as interested. It smells foreign, it smells mm -hmm. bad. <laughs> <laughs> also as Best Bees clients, you know, we, we do the harvesting for you if you don't want to. So it's almost just as easy as that, you know, Flo's model was to make it just so easy to, to just get your honey, but we do that for you. So <laughs> I kind of think it kind of solves, solves that too. Yeah, to add, you know, we're scientific beekeepers and one of our values is inclusive innovation. And so we're always trying out new beehives. So whether it's the flow hive or data sensors with the smart hive, we're always fiddling with this. And so are our beekeepers in different regions. So that's an exciting thing too. So with the flow, Paige said that we've tried this out in Boston. Uh, it's, you know, been really fun to play around with. We've also done this in LA and Cape Cod. And so as we roll out more data sensors and hear more from you guys and from our team about thoughts or what you're seeing around the world. This is our vision, playing around with them and then sharing them with you guys so we can scale it. Yeah. Amazing. Great answer. I have okay. a question. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Right <laughs> and I'll come off video even. I mean, come on. Ah, yeah. Do you want to um, introduce yourself and uh, say sure. how long you've been with Best Bees? <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm Kristen Simak. I'm actually um, in the North Carolina region. And uh, this event was posted on one of our, our sites internally. And <laughs> so I decided to come. Oh, welcome. Hey, so, <laughs> to have you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I, I, I think it's great. It's been, it's been fantastic so far. And, but I did, I had a question. So Renee mentioned some of the complementary plants, I guess, for like squash. And while I haven't had a lot of trouble with it, I know that there's, I've had some friends that have had um, trouble with their gardens not producing. And so I was wondering if there were any other kind of complementary uh, plants that you would recommend to help the, attract the bees and the pollinators. Sure. I mean, I'm a huge, I like all of the, um, 
companion planting, but I like to bring in beneficial insects. So I just think the more flowers you can plant, the better. Um, what's happening now with huge agriculture is they're actually coming around to say, you know what, if we do borders and borders and borders of plants like echinacea and goldenrod and lupine and all of these wonderful plants, then the good insects come in to help eat the bad insects. So specifically, I like the herbs. I like the flowers that I talked about. I like sweet alyssa. Um, it depends on what size garden, borage, marigolds, lavender, um, a lot of that is what I recommend. And again, then you're cutting flowers, your daisies, your cone flowers. Cleome is a flower that is, it takes over. I can't really plant it here um, because it just takes over and it's crazy. But if someone has a lot of space, you can plant something like that. That's another one that's great. Um, so I think that it's just all about creating masses of it. So black eyed daisy, a cone flower, regular daisy, white daisies, things like that. Um, cosmos, zinnias, all of Thank that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Now I am gonna just go ahead. Somebody had asked about the shade and of course I, I got distracted and had to go look in my book and see that there are some shade plants. And one of them listed there is lupine. Um, and I grew up on the Cape, so it likes that sandy soil, but that's one that can handle. I don't know who was asking about the shade, but um, that those that's what I just pulled out of the book really quick. <laughs> that we know are natives and that are um, pollinator habitat plants. So that's good to know. I didn't know goldenrod actually. I thought goldenrod was like full sun, full meadow, um, wildflower garden. So it's great to know that that can handle um, the shade as well. I wanted to mention one more thing too, as I kick it with my foot, but part of having a really good, healthy pollinator habitat, we know we're not using pesticides. We now know that we're planting to feed the bees. Um, but you also, water is something that they like. So I, what I recommend doing is getting like a shallow dish and then drinking a lot of wine. And, and then the wine corks you put in the shallow dish bowl. So that's just a fun project and it was, it's something else to do to create an environment for your bees. I used to love watering my bees at night. I would get home and I would go out with a glass of water and I would fill up their bee bowl and they all line up around it and they lap it all up and they're just so adorable. So water is important, no pesticides, lots of food, shelter being our beehives that we have. There's lots of ways that we can create healthy habitat for our bees and our other pollinators. Thanks, Renee. I have a question for you, Renee. Sure. Um, in the plant PDF that we'll send around after this event, um, <laughs> there's a portion that we included about soil. And I was curious how much you take into consideration the soil. I know there can be sandy, chalky, well-drained, all sorts of things. Is that something that you're really looking at when you plant plants? Yes, absolutely. So right plant, right place. If you have like strawberries, blueberries, they love acidic soil. So that's why they do so well for us here in New England because we have all the pine trees. Um, that lupin I was talking about, it likes a sandy soil, which is why I think you probably are aware of this with all the beehives we have down on the outer cape. They love it down there. If I were to bring that lupin back here, I'm in Wayland, and sink it into my moist, really rich, heavy soil, it's probably not going to do so well. When a plant is put into an environment where it's not naturally wanting to be, it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of fertilizer, it's a lot of maintenance, it's a lot of pruning, it's a lot of care. So soil to me, I, I'm a huge soil person. Like it all starts with our soil. Half, can, half compost, half loam is pretty much everything I plant. But yes, you want to take into consideration when you're choosing your plants, what your zone is, um, what the sun is, and what kind of soil you're growing in for sure. And you can also do soil tests easy. They're cheap. It costs you 20, 25 bucks to send off here in Massachusetts, UMass Soil Lab. They'll tell you what your pH is. They'll tell you what your organic content matter is. All of these things are pretty important for when you're planting a garden, whether it's a food garden or a perennial pollinator habitat garden. Great question. That's fascinating. And is there any eyeball check that you can do? I mean, you would, I'm sure, rolling, this, rolling the ground around, you can feel if it's more sandy or more moist. Yeah, you can kind of see it. You know, the old, old timers could smell it. They could taste it. I feel like sometimes I know when I walk onto a property based on what weeds are growing or based on the density of it. 
Um, but I think for most people, they really should think about sending off a soil sample or doing a cute little home kit. That That's not good for pH or anything, but it's good to get an idea of what do you have, silt, sand, um, rocks, clay? Because some plants can't grow in clay. I, I don't blame them, but I, some plants can. So pick the ones that are right for the spot. Don't try to force it. I think that we, we should learn that we, we're forcing it all the time, like enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, let, let be. Let right? Go. Like, stop trying to force it. Mother Nature's like, no more. <laughs> <laughs> and most of these plants you talked about today, Renee, these are plants that will grow and bloom during the hot summer, drier months. Yep, we've okay. talked mostly about, uh, there's a lot of herbs on this table. There's a lot of drought tolerant. Um, and I think that was our goal for today was to kind of talk about like, what can we plant now that'll then give our bees that summer bloom? Again, herbs, but let them flower. Don't just plant the herbs and then cut the flowers. Plant the herbs, one for you, six for them, and then leave the flowers. They're so beautiful. I mean, basil, it, there's a blue African basil that I'm obsessed with. And last year I have a 2,600 square foot garden that I maintain and it's all food but it's so much space. So we put in like a four by four patch of just this African blue um, basil that I'd never seen before. And it will go in every garden that I have this year because every time I was there, all it was covered in bees. Every time I was like, man, they love it. They also love marijuana. I'm just gonna throw it out there. If you let your ma marijuana throw up a seed, a, a flower, the male, some people pull it because once you have your male plant, it's not a smokable bud. Um, I did it for my bees and they love it. So that's an interesting, for Massachusetts, of course. Yeah, and we've actually, in one of our, or maybe two of our honey DNA reports, we've had sativa come back as a, as a species of plant. Well, that's cool. <laughs> I think more people are growing it now because you can. Yeah. It is a weed. It's pretty easy. Great stuff. Um, Asteria asks, uh, where can we buy some of these less common plants, perhaps like the African basil you just mentioned? Um, is, are you local to Wayland? Because I'll have that. <laughs> no, I'm in New Hampshire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just Google it. I don't know. I don't know what's up in New Hampshire, but that African blue is worth getting. Like maybe one of your nurseries will have it locally. I don't, I don't know. It's the blue African basil. I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's literally shoots up blue plumes. They're so pretty. And it was just, I didn't eat it. I didn't, I didn't even try it. I didn't care. All I knew was that every single, I visited the garden weekly. And one of the first things I would do is go over and be like, let's go check out blue. And it would just be covered in bees. And I'm like, man, they can't get enough of this. So um, African blue, the, the nursery where I get it is in Connecticut. Connecticut. It's called Gilberties, but I don't know. They must sell to someone in New Hampshire. Hmm. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it's my favorite. It's like, uh, it has to go in every garden this year. And just to share a little bit in case it's more of a new concept for any of our clients or anyone attending. So the nectar dearth concept um, in New England and really in most places, even if it's a an area that doesn't go through a winter where, where it's below freezing temperatures. There really is a period called a nectar flow. There's typically two in a year. Um, one that starts in the spring, typically around late April. I mean, of course you see crocus and trees starting to bud early, but it really kicks off late April and goes through end of June. That's the spring nectar flow, um, specifically here in, in New England. It starts a little bit more like mid-May to be full, full flow. And then we get another one in September that goes through October. Um, so that's really when your bees are sourcing a lot of the nectar that's getting them through the year. But no doubt they are still sourcing nectar where available during those summer months. Um, so it's important to have food sources available for those southern months, so it's, uh, summer months. <laughs> and that is kind of what we are hoping to be able to give them by giving you these, these great plant ideas. Well, the sunflowers and the solidago, the goldenrod, those are all late summer through fall. Um, so those are fantastic. I think that, um, I thought there was another one, and the aster. 
and those are pretty common, easy plants to get. Sunflowers you're gonna plant now. You can start planting them, you know, closer to June when the soil warms up. But I would say that to definitely plant the, um, the goldenrod and then the aster for that late summer fall push. Awesome. Cool. Well, we have five minutes. Um, I would love to take any final questions if you have them. Um, if not, we can kind of give you a little wrap up and yeah, any, any final questions before we head out? Thanks everybody again. This was super good, super fun. Good way to start it off. I feel like I'm gonna, we have another event later on this afternoon and then I'm gonna plant all my plants. Yeah. yeah, we want to thank all of you for coming. It is so fun to be together, even in a virtual space like this. Um, you know, don't be shy. You know where to reach us if you have any more questions. Uh, we'll be sharing a plant list by email. Um, you probably get that tomorrow morning at the very latest. Uh, so you can, you know, you know, we covered a lot of ground, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, once again, thank you. And thank you for your support. Uh, we, we are really grateful for you. Um, your bees are on their way. <laughs> yes. And your bees are on the way. So you have them. Okay. Thank you. All thank right. You. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.